Good morning. I'm Richard Abor. I'm president of the Crime Commission. Welcome to our all our old friends and welcome to some new ones. We are greatly appreciative of the fact that you're here. In fact, you're always here, uh, which is wonderful. So this morning, we continue a discussion about what is becoming an increasingly important topic as the city, as the city continues, I don't want to begin, as the city continues to think about how we recalibrate the criminal justice system in order to respond to the issues that are now present as opposed to issues that were present many years ago. This is all an incredibly good sign. This is an incredibly important conversation. It is a step in the evolution of the city. It is, to me, in many ways, one more indication of how successful we have been in the fight against crime in both the very, very short term and obviously the very long term, but how we have to understand some of the fallout from that and how we also do have to rethinking, be rethinking, excuse me, how we carry out um, our business. So this is an important conversation. I am very grateful to Jeremy and his team for continuing the research that they do on this, um, on this topic. You know, you, you just, you know, I guess one of the hallmarks of the success of crime fighting in this city has been to make the crime fighting based on information, on research. And that's certainly what we're doing here. So we have a rather packed morning, so I'm going to dispense with their traditional, somewhat longer introductions and get right into the heat of this. Um, we're going to have three presenters this morning, led by the Chief Judge and then Jeremy and Preti. Um, the Chief Judge is going to make some remarks about this topic, and then Jeremy is going to go through the report. I guess you're both going to go through the report. Um, and then at the end, we will have questions. If I can just ask the press to allow our guests to ask questions first, I appreciate it. And then, of course, the press is more than welcome to ask any questions. Um, I am also not going to do, as I said, the formal introduction because they're in the invites. And if there's one person I certainly don't need to, um, did I say invite? Introduce. Sorry. Introduce is the Chief Judge. Let me just say this. The, we are always incredibly honored to have the Chief Judge with us. The Chief Judge has been a fabulous friend to law enforcement and criminal justice. He's incredibly thoughtful. I have the luxury of having many conversations with him, not in a public setting, and they are always very enlightening. Judge, you are welcome here anytime. Please come up. Thanks, Richard. It always is a delight to be here. Um, I think we do have to get into this subject, and, uh, and it's one that's very much uh, uh, topical, especially in light of uh, the things that the court system, uh, the city administration, the mayor, the PD, that we've all done together and um, in reforming the summons process. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, I won't call it a debate, but some of the dialogue that's been going on about uh, decriminalization of the summons process and uh, what we should be doing in that regard, or at least my take on where we are. So um, let me again thank Richard and the uh, Citizens Crime Commission for sponsoring this event today. I want to commend uh, Jeremy Travis, <coughs> uh, Professor Chauhan, and the researchers from John Jay College who have undertaken what you will shortly uh, be seeing and hearing, and it is a uh, truly impressive analysis of the summons process in New York City. Their work is very timely, given the considerable attention that has been devoted to the summons process in recent months. In fact, <clears throat> over the past year, the court system under the leadership of uh, First Deputy Chief Administrative Judge uh, Lawrence Marks has been carefully evaluating what we need to do to improve the summons process, to modernize it, and to make it more effective. As part of this evaluation, we have also been contemplating more fundamental questions about the summons process. Questions such as, what purpose should the summons process be serving 
and whether it is actually promoting that purpose. As we were conducting this evaluation, the mayor and the police commissioner announced last year the new policy that most individuals charged with possessing small amounts of marijuana would no longer be arrested, but would instead be issued summonses returnable in court. Because of the increase in summons cases that many were anticipating due to this change in policy, an increase that interestingly enough, enough has not yet materialized, we prioritized our analysis by concentrating first on immediate steps we needed to be taking to improve the summons process. Working closely with the Mayor's Office on Criminal Justice and the Police Department, we developed together a comprehensive program that was announced just a few weeks ago. Let me firstly, first briefly summarize the program and then I will return to the more fundamental questions that again have been so much in the public dialogue in recent days. The program we announced and are now implementing starts from what I think is an obvious premise, that the vast majority of people who receive summonses are not hardened criminals by any stretch of the imagination. Far more often than not, they have jobs, families, and the other responsibilities of everyday people. As a group, they bear no resemblance to people arrested for felony offenses. And for the most part, they also differ from people arrested for misdemeanor offenses whose cases are heard in our main courthouses. So these are generally law-abiding people, people who adhere to societal norms and values. Given that, something is inherently wrong if as the John Jay research documents nearly 40% failed to show up in court on the date the police issued summons directs them to do so. This is particularly troubling because as the John Jay research shows, the immediate consequence of failing to show up in summons court, the issuance of a warrant, is literally always worse than the consequences of appearing in court in these cases. Indeed, in recent years, Barely more than a quarter of summonses result in a conviction. And in the overwhelming number of cases that do, close to 100%, the sentence is only a fine, usually a very modest fine. So, if generally law-abiding people are failing to show up in court in great numbers when a police-issued summons directs them to do so, and where the consequence of not showing up is almost always, if not always, worse than if they do show up, again, something has got to be wrong. Therefore, it was incumbent upon the court system to examine our own operations and determine whether the changes in the way the summons court is handling these cases were needed. This is exactly what we have done. We are now implementing a series of measures that will make the summons process more comprehensible and more navigable. Steps that should far better ensure that people who receive summonses show up in court. For starters, working closely with the city and with behavioral economists, we have revamped the summons form itself to make it easy to understand, to make it crystal clear when the individual is required to appear in court and that a failure to appear will result in issuance of an arrest warrant. For example, the most important information on the summons form for the defendant, where and when to appear in court, will now appear in plain and concise language at the very top of the form. The redesigned summons form will also include a phone number and website where individuals can access their cases verify the date of their court appearance, and see whether they have outstanding warrants. The website will also have translated copies of the summons form in multiple languages. The new form will be operational this summer. Moreover, beginning next month, 
The courts will also be testing a number of types of reminders of court appearances to those who have received summonses using both robocalls and text messages. The method that proves most effective will then be used citywide. In addition, beginning this summer in Manhattan, those who receive summonses will be permitted to appear any business day a week in advance of the court appearance date specified in the summons, including new evening hours that will be established one night a week. All this information will be clearly exp explained in the new summons form. Further steps are being taken to improve transparency and the quality of justice in summons court. The city is already posting detailed data showing summons activity broken down by charge and precinct. Importantly, the summons form will now include the individual's race, allowing far more expansive and detailed demographic research and reporting about people who receive summonses. Additionally, the summons court is now providing defense attorneys with tablets that display all of the factual allegations for the cases on the calendar, allowing counsel to better advise their clients. Also beginning this summer, those who receive fines will be able to pay them online. And finally, 18 B lawyers who handle summons cases and judicial hearing officers who preside in summons court will be receiving enhanced training, including training on the potential collateral consequences of summons offense convictions. So these are the measures that we are implementing that we, will believe, we believe will improve the quality of justice in summons court, enhance the transparency of the summons process, and better ensure that people who receive summonses appear in court. These are all important and necessary steps. But on a more fundamental level, I firmly believe it is time, I firmly believe it is time for some serious thinking about the purpose of the summons process and whether that purpose is being promoted in the way we currently handle these matters. This analysis implicates consideration of important public policy issues so it needs to take place not only within the judicial branch, but by all of us in the criminal justice system. But what broader public purpose do we want the summons process and the summons court in particular to be serving? It is my view that the overriding goal of the summons process should be to promote the quality of life in this city. We certainly all agree that quality of life offenses need to be addressed. When they are ignored, that can diminish public health and safety, stifle economic progress and discourage tourism, cause people to move elsewhere, and other more otherwise make life in the city less livable and demoralizing. Whether or not you call it broken windows or by any other name, I believe in common sense. And my own common sense tells me that ignoring quality of life offenses can create an environment leading to the commission of more serious criminal activity. And that's why in the court system, our community and problem-solving courts are based on the premise that every crime, no matter how minor, must have a consequence. Otherwise, respect for the rule of law is surely damaged. Make no mistake about it. So, is the summons process, in fact, promoting quality of life in New York City? Is summon, summons court effectively punishing those who commit quality of life offenses? And is it effectively deterring people from committing these offenses? I wonder. The number of summonses issued citywide in a typical year is an enormous number. It usually exceeds the number of people arrested 
annually in the city. For example, last year, 391,171 summonses were issued in the city, more than the 351,511 arrests that were made. In a world of limited resources, and trust me, the court system very much operates in a world of limited resources. And with the brunt of court resources necessarily going to the more serious arrest cases, these mammoth numbers of summons cases cannot possibly receive the attention and resources that they should. With this huge number of cases and with the limited resources to devote to them, how effective can the summons court be? A truly effective summons court would have available to it a panoply of consequences, of sanctions that could be tailored to the circumstances of the individual cases and defendants that come before it. For example, since quality of life offenses by definition are offenses against the community, community service can be an appropriate and highly effective sentence for an individual convicted of a summons offense. But establishing and operating community service programs is labor intensive and expensive. Given the current caseloads, doing so on any meaningful scale in summons court is simply not possible. This leads me to think that policymakers need to look carefully at ways to reduce the number of cases in summons court. In particular, consideration should be given to whether some of these cases even belong in the criminal courts to begin with. That ultimately is a legislative determination. But we need to have a serious discussion about whether some of the offenses now being charged in summonses involve conduct that society, in fact, needs to be classifying as criminal offenses. It is not a taboo subject. Our policymakers must grapple with it, and they must do so with a nuanced approach, approach that tries to distinguish between conduct that should result in criminal charges with all that that portends, as opposed to less serious, less culpable violations of societal norms. We should be mindful that while offenses charged in summonses are never felonies and are usually not even misdemeanors, a conviction of these offenses is still a conviction and summons court is still a criminal court. And a conviction, even for a summons offense, potentially carries with it serious collateral consequences such as loss of employment, loss of public housing, or even deportation, consequences that may be grossly disproportionate to the harm caused by the offense. So for both of these reasons, that summons court is handling far too many cases to be able to adjudicate them effectively, and that at least some of the offenses currently handled in summons court should, in all fairness, not be classified as criminal offenses, a better policy approach may well be to substitute civil penalties for these offenses and assign responsibility for adjudicating them to an administrative tribunal. This is currently how many offenses against the law in New York City are handled. For example, tra traffic violations such as speeding, running a red light, and running a stop sign are all handled in an administrative tribunal, not in a criminal court, and in my view, rightly so. As I noted, this, however, ultimately is a legislative determination. As chief judge, it is not my institutional role to pick and choose which offenses belong in criminal courts and which belong in administrative tribunals. But I am not oblivious to the fact that there are arguments on both sides of this issue as it relates to different defenses now resulting in the issuance of criminal summonses. 
a strong argument can be made that an offense such as public urination, which can severely diminish quality of life in our communities, should continue to be a criminal event offense adjudicated in summons court. A similarly strong argument can be made for fair beating, strict enforcement of which has been shown to dramatically reduce other crimes in the subway system. If the issuance of a criminal summons makes for a more livable, safe city, then why not keep these offenses in a criminal context that best serves the well-being of the community? Look how far we've come. Let's not go backwards. On the other hand, it can certainly be argued that other offenses now treated as criminal in nature, such as public consumption of alcohol, riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, and being in a park after hours, are more benign and perhaps need not be classified as criminal offenses. As you will see from the John Jay research, public consumption of alcohol cases constitute fully one quarter of all cases in summons court. I'm not talking here about an un unruly binge drinker. That is and should be another offense that properly belongs in criminal court, such as disorderly conduct. But for the tens of thousands of summonses that represent nothing more, for example, than drinking a can of be beer on a stoop, that's a different story. Is that really a more serious offense than speeding or running a red light, such that it needs to be adjudicated in criminal court? If an administrative tri tribunal adjudicated that offense, would that in any, meaningful, in any meaningful way diminish public safety or the quality of life in this city? Transferring public alcohol consumption cases from summons court to an administrative tribunal would alone reduce the summons court, the summons court docket by nearly 100,000 cases. The great benefit of doing that is that with a more manageable caseload, summons court could devote more attention to the remaining more serious cases, those that we could agree appropriately belong in a criminal court and require the more serious consideration that a criminal court otherwise should be able to provide. This would mean that a sanction such as community service, which can be a successful restorative response to quality of life offenses and could be far more effective in reducing recidivism, could become for the first time a viable option in summons court. And I think some of the recent discussion about if someone is asked for their ID and can they be detained, this issue can be resolved either legislatively or administratively and doesn't deter the kind of discussion that we need to have about these different offenses and what should remain criminal and what should not. I understand that there are two sides to this discussion and that some of us will disagree on precisely where to draw the line between illegal behavior that should be treated as criminal conduct and that which should be treated as a civil offense. But there is nothing, nothing sacrosanct in the distinctions that we presently make. With some serious discussion, I believe people of goodwill can and will be able to agree that certain offenses can be taken out of summons court and handled administratively, while other offenses must and should remain criminal in nature. And we could certainly agree together that there is a thoughtful dialogue that need, we need to be having and that further changes in the summons process are critical and necessary for the well-being of the city. So let's stop the over-the-top rhetoric on the decriminalization of summonses. 
roll up our sleeves and get down to business. We have already taken concrete steps to better ensure that individuals who receive summonses appear in court. Measures to promote more transparency in the summons process. Actions that will enhance the quality of justice in summons court. We now need serious, nuanced thought about the goals we want to be achieving through the summons process and whether summons court is effectively achieving those goals. I look forward to continuing this discussion with all of you in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's why he's chief judge. <laughs> what, what more do I need to say? Thank you, Judge. That's a very uh, insightful and, frankly, nuanced uh, way to be thinking about this. And I think you offer wise advice to those who are in this dialogue. Um, before I ask Jeremy to start, I did want to convey one message. I just didn't want to do it before the judge stood up. Um, the police commissioner was here earlier and can, wanted me to convey his regret that he had a pre-existing speech that he could not get out of. But to also thank Jeremy and his team for coming in and briefing him, saying that he was supportive of that and uh, actually very supportive of this research. In fact, I think the department's been quite cooperative in getting them the data they needed. He also asked me to announce that they too have been looking at quality of life offenses and will be publicly issuing a report on this on Thursday. So we'll look forward to that as well. Jeremy? Well, good morning, everybody. Let me uh, first thank uh, Richard Aborn and the Citizens Crime Commission for, once again, this is our second uh, uh, opportunity to appear before you, uh, providing this uh, forum for discussion of research that we're conducting at uh, John Jay. The commission is uh, the ideal platform for dissemination of criminal justice research and discussion of important policy questions, such as this one. Uh, I also want to express my appreciation to Chief Judge Lipman and the team at the Office of Court Administration uh, for making uh, this uh, presentation uh, possible, but more importantly for his uh, service to our state over many years on uh, matters of, of justice. He is truly uh, inspirational. And the reforms that he announced today we will talk about uh, uh, as a backdrop because these actually will change the reality that we're describing uh, here this morning in important ways. So I'll introduce in a second uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Preeti Shohan, who's a psychology professor at John Jay. Uh, she is the leader of a remarkable team at the college, uh, a project we call the Misdemeanor Justice Project. So let me give that background uh, just to help an understanding of where we are in this work. We created the Misdemeanor Justice Project over two years ago to harness the power of data analytics for precisely the purpose that Richard mentioned at the outset, uh, which is to improve our understanding of the interactions between the agencies of the justice system, particularly the police, and members of the public accused of committing low-level offenses, hence the phrase misdemeanor justice. Our first report was released here at the Citizen Crime Commission on October 28, 2014, and that, I'm sure you all have uh, your own dog-eared copy of it, uh, that presented an uh, analysis of misdemeanor arrests in New York City between 1980 and 2013. Today's report is on summonses. We've been supported in this work by the uh, Laura and John Arnold Foundation, and we are now, this is a preview of coming attractions, working on four follow-up studies that we will release maybe here, maybe elsewhere in the months to come. One is looking at pretrial detention for misdemeanor arrests over the 33-year period. Uh, we're looking at the trends of the issuance of desk appearance tickets. We're looking at the relationship uh, between calls for service and misdemeanor arrests, very closely tied to the work uh, Commissioner Bratton is talking about, quality of life offenses, and the phenomenon of off offender mobility, where people get arrested compared to where they live. So the overarching mission of this project, so to put today's presentation in that context, is to provide objective uh, data analysis. Uh, to illuminate policy discussions such as the one uh, the chief uh, referred to uh, in what is the appropriate response to low-level crimes and misbehavior. 
We take no position on any of the debates that are swirling around us. Uh, and uh, we also recognize, because it's obvious, that today's report, which is over a year in the making, I want to add, is coming out at a propitious time, because there's an intense debate underway about summonses. So our timing is fortunate, and we hope that this report uh, serves as a useful point of reference, and thank uh, Chief Judge Lippman for referring to it in his remarks this morning. A quick thank you. Uh, this is where I see if the clicker is working. There it is. Uh, the data we're presenting come from the Office of Court Administration. Uh, the Police Department also collects data on summonses, but we've relied on the court data. Uh, so we want to thank uh, the Chief Judge and Judge uh, Marks, and uh, in particular, Ron Youngkins and Justin Barry and his team for their support, and more importantly, their patience, as all of us try to understand this very arcane world. We thank Commissioner Bratton uh, and his executive team for their feedback on an earlier version of these analyses presented a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've also benefited from the expertise of our uh, partners, uh, data partners listed there, representing city and state agencies. And uh, again, thank you to the uh, Lauren John Arnold Foundation and Ann Milgram uh, and her staff there. They've provided not only financial support, but uh, very important feedback from their national perspective as to what they're seeing around the country. So finally, I can't go any further without extending my thanks to the entire uh, misdemeanor justice team at John Jay, the doctoral students, graduate students, and faculty led by Professor Shohan. So just join me for a second in asking them to stand so I can say thank you before we go on to recognize them for their work. Where are they? They're in the back. There they are. Oh, they're already standing. That's how good they are. <laughs> so, so let's step back one more uh, direction uh, just to look at the analysis that Preeti will uh, point out in a second. So we start with and this really builds on Chief Judge's uh, uh, statements. So we want to look at a decade. It's really 11 years, but we'll call it a decade, 2003 to 2013. Uh, just to be clear, we're examining one type of summons. There are many, there are A, B, and C summons. These are C summonses, criminal court summonses, not the A summonses that are parking violations or B summonses that are moving violations. Criminal court summonses, definitional uh, distinction that's important. These rep criminal court summonses represent the most frequent interactions between law enforcement and the public. They're very high volume. So let's put the context around that statement. So these, this first line here on the graph shows these are felony arrests over the decade of, uh, of study here, about 90,000 per year over this period of time. Secondly, in our last report, uh, we documented misdemeanor arrests, which are more frequent. They have shown not a, not a stable trend, but actually a very important decline over this period of time, up to 2013. And they rose to uh, 221,000 in 2003. From that, I'm sorry, 2003 to nearly 300,000 in 2010, before dropping to 265,000 in 2013. These are big changes, masked a bit by the scale here. But if you remember our first report, these are big changes in misdemeanor arrest activity. Two other police practices, law enforcement practices, have displayed even more significant changes over this decade. We'll talk in a moment about summonses. These are summonses. So a big change in summons activity over this 11-year uh, period we call a decade. And we'll talk, that's the subject today. But look at this. This is stop and frisk activity over the same decade. So stops rose from 160,000 in 2003 to 685,000 in 2011, before declining sharply to 191,000 in 2013. So we recognize, of course, that each of these enforcement actions represents a different exercise of legal authority granted to the police. But our perspective is police-citizen encounters. So from that perspective, all of these matter in different ways. And we take them together to look at the overall aggregate effect of the relationship between uh, police and public. So this is an important, fluid, and changing reality in our city of great significance. So let me make one final point. Although we don't talk about it in our report, it's important to note that we end here in 2013 for reasons that Preeti will describe. But the data from 2014 provided by uh, our public agencies shows continuing declines in misdemeanor arrests, continuing declines in pedestrian stops, and continuing declines in summonses. So this reality has changed a lot, 
and we will report on those changes in future reports uh, from the Misdemeanor Justice uh, Project. So let's start with the, a simple fact. First fact to a takeaway fact, the level of summonses, as Chief Judge Lippman noted, is, I would say, staggering. Over the 11 years covered by this report, nearly 6 million summonses were issued. The annual volume ranged from 439,000 to 607,000 over this decade. The daily volume, every day, police officers writing summonses, ranged from 1,200 to 1,600 a day, seven days a week. Every year, as the chief pointed out, the number of summonses issued more than exceeds the combined felony and misdemeanor arrest total. Second fact, obvious, we've talked about it already, but important to note it, this high volume of enforcement activity is focused on very low level offenses. In 2013, the most recent year covered in our report, the most frequent charges were public consumption of alcohol, number one, disorderly conduct, number two, public urination, number three, park offenses, number four, and riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, number five. So to complete this big overview of our report, we should ask what happens to these cases in court. So here's the third fact. In only a small percentage does the summons result in a conviction. Let's break that down briefly. We'll do the more detailed look in a second. A quarter of the summonses were never brought before a judge and never brought into the courtroom because 18% were deemed legally insufficient and 6% were deemed defective. Another 41% resulted in a dismissal in court or an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. Many, 36% result in a warrant. Here's a caveat. That's at any time in the case. Some for failure to pay a fine. It's only 14% that are warrants after the uh, period of the report has ended. But ultimately, only one in five, 21% to be precise, over this decade resulted in a plea of guilty or in a small number, a finding of guilt. And, as Chief Judge Lippman noted, Almost all of those, 99% of those who plead guilty, are ordered to pay a fine. In 2013, those fines totaled more than $5 million. So the picture painted by these data, in large picture, I think is very troubling. Our report describes a system that labors mightily, but inefficiently, to process a staggering number of cases from enforcement to adjudication. So granted, each of these offenses is by definition minor, but this process reaches deep into the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers each year. So in recognition of this reality, we just want to commend Chief Judge Lippman, Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Bratton, Director Elizabeth Glazer for their package of reform initiatives. I think we can say there's no doubt that these innovations that combine technology and flexibility and behavioral economics, uh, I learned, uh, will undoubtedly result in a process that simply works better for the thousands of New Yorkers who must answer a summons each year. Yet at the same time, our report raises, but we do not answer, larger questions regarding the effectiveness and the fairness of this system. Is the issuance of a summons the best way to respond to the offense or to address underlying community conditions? Is the use of the criminal court the best way to adjudicate this sort of low-level misconduct? How can our legal system best hold people accountable for their conduct when the offense itself is relatively minor? To what extent does this type of enforcement activity contribute to public safety? What is the role of these enforcement powers in a multifaceted crime prevention strategy? How does the high volume of summonses enhance or detract from the legitimacy of the justice system? How do the outcomes in court including the convictions and the dismissals and the warrants, affect the life circumstances of those New Yorkers who receive these summonses? Are these policies carried out in ways consistent with the principle of equal treatment, uh, the responsive to citizen expectations for effective policing? So we created the Misdemeanor Justice Project two years ago in the hope that our statistical reports over the years will contribute to a robust policy discussion 
that grapples with those complex questions. We've been very gratified with the response to our first report and have high hopes that this one that we released today will be equally well received. So we look forward to continuing to work with all of you and the Citizens Crime Commission in the months and years ahead. So I'm delighted now to turn to Professor Preeti Shohan, who is our leader in this effort. Oh, there, that's her slide. Uh, and uh, she represents a great team, and I look forward to your questions afterwards. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, I want to echo our previous two speakers and say thank you to Richard Aborn and the Citizens Crime Commission for allowing us to use this platform to release our second report. Excuse me, while I just get there. There we go. Better? Yep. Okay. And also to Chief Judge and the team at OCA for providing the data and really helping us understand this very complex process. Um, I want to say the slides that you have in front of you, I've, I've taken some out. Just so as you're following along, there are some that you'll just have to skip past in the interest of time. So there are five main central questions to our analyses here. So has the issue of C summonses increased? And you've already gotten a preview of that, and the answer is no. In fact, it has decreased. Who is getting issued C summonses? What are the charges? What are the dispositions of those charges? How many summonses result in a warrant? And more importantly, remain an open warrant? And what are the sentences for those disposed as guilty? So before I get into the data, I want to explain to you the very complex process of a summons. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through this slide here because it is important and it goes into a lot of nuances in terms of who gets issued a summons, who can issue a summons, etc. So first, and this has been said, we're focusing on C summons. So this does not include parking violations, moving violations, or summons issued for tribunal courts, just C summons, which are processed in the five boroughs and then the two community courts, Midtown Community Court and Red Hook Community Justice Center. Forty different agencies in the city of New York can issue a C summons. Primarily, this is done by the NYPD, over 97% during our decade or study period. Um, but other agencies that can issue a C summons include the New York City Fire Department, the Triborough Transit Authority, and there's an entire list and it's actually in the report. In addition to multiple agencies being issued a sum, being able to issue a summons, a person can get multiple summonses per incident. So uh, in a given incident, an individual can get up to 10 summonses um, during that one incident. So, and I want to note that this has changed dramatically over the course of our decade. So in 2003, 22% of individuals got more than one summons during a given incident, and this decreased to 8% in 2013. So part of that decline that we see in the red line is because fewer people are getting multiple summonses per incident. So now in terms of the process, so all summonses arrive at this place called the Central Receiving Unit, and there the summons is examined for defectiveness. So it can be defective for multiple reasons, one being the wrong court date, for instance, which is a holiday or weekend. Um, if it's found defective, the person gets a letter saying they don't have to come to court and it does not get docketed. If it's not defective, then it moves to the next process. It gets docketed and sent to the individual courts. Now some of these individual courts go through what we call a SAFD review, or a review for legal sufficiency, sufficiency prior to arraignment. The two courts that don't engage in this are Staten Island and Red Hook Community Justice Center. So now, if a summons is found legally insufficient, for example, a summons can be found legally insufficient if in the narrative it doesn't indicate what type of alcohol it is for a public consumption of alcohol. But summons is found legally insufficient, the person gets a letter saying that they don't have to come to arraignment. If it's then found legally, legally sufficient, it proceeds to the next level. And multiple things can happen. If the person shows up for arraignment, there's some sort of disposition. It can be dismissed. It can be ACD, guilty, other, other is a small percentage, could be acquittals, resentences, etc. If the person doesn't come to arraignment, then there's a warrant. 
a couple of other nuances. If a, if a person is disposed as, if a summons is disposed as guilty and there's a sentence or a fine and the person is unable to pay that sentence or fine, they can also get a warrant. More often a civil judgment order is, um, is given, but they can also get a warrant in that, in that scenario. And then with ACDs, just for community courts, community service is also a possible sentence. So that is sort of the multiple layers of how a summons eventually gets to disposition and what happens to it. So we're gonna go through each one of these layers. So this has been touched on um, by Jeremy, but what I wanna do is just show you at the aggregate level what happens to summonses. So in terms of, um, in terms of uh, all the summonses in a given, throughout our decade, about 24% do not require a court appearance, either because they were defective or legally insufficient, 62% get disposed, and 14% is the other. I'm gonna break down the purple and the blue, but the other is essentially open warrants, disposition unknown, or a pending case of some kind. When we examine the no court appearance required, what we see is that 18% of all summonses are found legally insufficient and 6% defective. So if we look at it, nearly 6 million over the course of the decade, more than 1 million are found legally insufficient. Then when we look at dispositions, and this has also been touched on, um, we, we have multiple outcomes, the most prominent being dismissed, so 23% dismissed, 18% ACD. So in approximately two in five summonses, the result is a dismissal or an ACD, and approximately one in five summonses results in a guilty disposition. Another way to look at summonses is to look to see how warrants are functioning. Now warrants can, as I said, be given at multiple times during a summons. And here we have the outcomes for warrants. And what we see is that 36% of all summonses during the course of this decade resulted in a warrant. 14% of all summonses remain open, it remain, it remain with an open warrant as of December 15th, 2014. This is a moving line, so some still continue to get closed out. And 22% of all summonses result in a vacated warrant. Now, among the warrants issued, another way to look at this is out of every 100 warrants issued, 60 get vacated, 40 remain open. Now we want to look at this sort of longitudinally and how have things changed over the course of the decade. So going back to this red line, which you've already seen, we know this is a high volume activity, 1,600 summonses per day in 2006. 1200 in 2013. Part of that decline is explained by a reduction in the number of summonses given per incident. We also, as we did with our first report, look at this as a, oh, excuse me, as a rate. So per 100,000 population. Now we acknowledge that a person can get multiple summonses within a year, and also, as you know now, multiple summonses within an incident, but we still think it's important to look at it by rates. And what we see is that 9,400 summonses are issued per 100,000 population in 2005. This declined to 6,600 per 100,000 population in 2013. So who is getting issued these summons? So we don't look at race and ethnicity here because that variable was not available consistently in our data set, but we do look at age and gender. So in terms of age, what we have here is summons is issued as a rate by age. This red line is 16 to 17 year olds, and we see that summonses, summons issuance for 16 to 17 year olds peaked in 2006 at 19% and then went down pretty dramatically to 9%. The blue line is 18 to 20 year olds. One pattern you see is that 18 to 20 year olds consistently get more summonses issued than the 16 to 17 year olds. They also had a peak in 2006 and also a decline. Green line 25 to 30, tw uh, excuse me, 21 to 24 year olds. That's gone up and down, but ultimately ends as the highest issuance age in 2013. 25 to 34 year olds relatively stable and 35 and older experience a bit of a decline. 
So this is what the age patterns look like, and I want you to note particularly that red line because we're going to come back to it. Next, to look at gender, this is a mainly male-driven phenomenon. So the declines are also explained by the fact that summonses are issued at a lower rate for men relative to women. This is not surprising. We see this generally in the criminal justice system, and we also saw it with our misdemeanor arrest report. So what are the most frequent charges? We had over 10,000 um, charge codes in the database, and there was no real way to be able to categorize all 10,000 charges. So what we decided to do was just look at the 10 most frequent charges that are in our database. So first, and this has already been alluded to, is public consumption of alcohol. And what we see is, I want to note that this is a percent of all charges. So raw numbers here can go up or down and are noted in the report, but here we're looking at it as, as a percentage of all charges. So first we see that public consumption of alcohol, open containers, account for a greater percentage of charges over the decade, from about 20% to about 30%. The next most frequent charge, the red bar is disorderly conduct. Now this remains about 13% in 2003 and 2013. There was a slight spike in 2007, but it went down. So what you can say is these two charges account for a pretty substantial percentage of all charges for summonses. The third charge is public urination. And this nearly doubled during the course of the study period. Fourth charge, park offenses, more than doubled from three to seven percent. Excuse me, riding bicycle on the sidewalk, um, also more than doubled, two percent to five percent. And then marijuana possession, trespassing, reckless driving, and noise violations all remain relatively low and stable. The last charge, unlicensed operation of motor vehicle for hire, went down by about half from 4% to 2%. Another trend you can see now that all the charges are up is that these 10 codes accounted from a little less than 60% of all charges in 2003 and then 77% of all charges in 2013. We then wanted to see, well, how do these charges break down by age and are there differential patterns in terms of age issuance by age. So first I'm going to show you the 16 to 17 year olds. So the blue line here is public consumption of alcohol. And we see that it's, it's relatively, when I lay it over with the red line, which is disorderly conduct, public consumption of alcohol is relatively low and stable. Disorderly conduct mm -hmm. was an extremely uh, high, uh, had an extremely high issuance rate in 2006 and then went down pretty dramatically. So that red line you saw earlier with the age-related charges, it's being driven by a decline in issuance for disorderly conduct among this group. Public urination is that green line, park offenses, riding bicycle on the sidewalk, and marijuana possession. So there's some variability there, but nothing is quite as striking as that disorderly conduct line, which actually went down pretty dramatically. Now let's compare that to the 18 to 20 year olds. We see 18 to 20 year olds already have a higher issuance rate for public consumption of alcohol relative to the younger age group. And disorderly conduct was predominant, also peaked in 2006 for this age group, but then went down. And the remaining charges, public urination remains relatively low, park offenses experienced a bit of an increase and the remaining charges all vary quite a bit, but nothing, again, quite as dramatic as public consumption of alcohol and disorderly conduct. Now, going on to 21 to 24-year-olds, what we see is, and this is gonna be the case now for all of our age groups, public remaining age groups. Public consumption of alcohol is consistently the highest issue, is, is the charge with the highest issuance rate, followed by disorderly conduct. We see that here with the 25 and 34-year-olds. And then finally, a similar pattern with the 35 and older. So what is happening to these summonses? First, let's look at defective. So defective summonses accounted for 
a little more than five and a half percent of all summonses in 2013 went down to less than four. It's the lowest it's been in 2013 for this decade. And we can also see on the, on the right that there's some variability by borough. So uh, the red line is the Bronx. The Bronx generally had the highest um, percent of defective summonses, but that essentially converged by 2013 with the rest of the boroughs. And what are some reasons for the defective summonses? I'm actually just going to pull all these up and show you. So that black line is that the original is not on file. And essentially, that was the predominant reason that a summons was found defective up until the past three years, at which point um, the wrong return date, so a date of a weekend or a holiday, became the predominant reason that a summons was defective. The blue line or the teal line that we see that's the second highest in 2013 is venue, which essentially means a wrong court or no court location was indicated on the summons. The other charges or the other reasons are relatively low compared to those, so no signature by the issuing agent, affidavit is missing, um, or uncon unconstitutional charges, which, which essentially means that it was a voided statute and a summons was given anyway. Now let's look at so legal insufficiency, dismissed, ACD, and guilty. So this is legal insufficiency prior to arraignment. Now dismissed in our category has legal insufficiency at arraignment, but we include it in the dismissed category. I know this is a little nuanced, but it's an important nuance to mention. So over the course of the decade, what we see is that about 20% of all summonses that are docketed are, are legally insufficient, and this remains relatively stable over the decade. Dismissals, on the other hand, went down from 29% to 19%. So the percent of cases dismissed reduced. ACD remained relatively stable at around 20%. And the percent of summonses disposed as guilty increased from 20% to 27%. So what we see is dismissals going down, guilty going up, but still a large share between 46 to 37%, um, either being legally insufficient dismissed or ACD. So what we wanted to do next is to see how this varied by the six most frequent charges. And you'll see that there's a lot of variability in, what, in how these cases are disposed. So first, we have public consumption of alcohol. So there are two charges that you can plea by mail, public consumption of alcohol and public urination. And I want you to keep that in mind as I show you these slides. So in terms of public consumption of alcohol, we see that legally insufficient is somewhere around 20 or lower. Guilt, uh, excuse me, dismissed is around 13, 14%. ACD remains relatively stable, and we see that a good portion is um, a, a disposition of guilty. So from 29% to 36%. So contrast that now to disorderly conduct. <clears throat> where in 2005, 40% of all disorderly conduct um, charges were found legally insufficient, and this went down to 30%. Dismissals went down slightly from 29 to 23, excuse me. And then ACD remained relatively stable and guilty increased. So you see that there's a much fewer percentage of guilty dispositions in disorderly conduct compared to public consumption of alcohol. Public urination, the blue line, legally insufficient prior to arraignment, very low, the lowest of all the charges that we've seen. So public urination is generally not found to be legally insufficient prior to arraignment. Dismissals are also quite low. ACD went down a little bit. And here's our guilty. So this charge has the higher proportion, highest proportion of guilty dispositions out of all the charges that we examined. In 2013, almost half of all public urination charges resulted in a guilty plea. Again, this is also a plea by mail charge. 
Park offenses, I'm just going to pull this up. So park offenses um, is most likely to result in an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. So about 30% are legally insufficient or dismissed in 2013 and a good chunk are ACD. Riding bicycle on the sidewalk, I want you to contrast this to the public urination. What we see here is in 2008, 60% of all riding bicycle on the sidewalks were found to be legally insufficient, and that went down to 50% by 2013. Dismissals remained about the same, ACDs went down, and guilty pleas, guilty dispositions for this charge decreased pretty substantially. So legally insufficient increase, dis, uh, guilty pleas decreased. And so in 2013, almost half of all riding bicycle on the sidewalk summonses were legally insufficient. Contrast that to public urination, which was about the same number, but for a guilty plea. So very variable in terms of what the outcome or disposition is gonna be based on the charge. Marijuana possession started the decade with more than 50% of all summonses being found legally insufficient. This went down pretty dramatically to almost 30%. Dismissals went down slightly, ACDs increased, and then guilties increased slightly. So next in terms of looking at warrants, how many summonses are issued a warrant? Is there any variability in this over the course of the decade? And so just the overall trend line suggests that there's not been a lot of variability in the percent of warrants issued per summonses. What we see is the percent of warrants vacated has increased if we don't account for 2013. 2013, it may be that just more warrants haven't had the opportunity to close out yet. Um, but essentially, 60% of all warrants get vacated, 40% remain open. For New York City, you will see um, the report has a lot of borough level analyses, and you'll see there are some pretty dramatic borough level differences in warrants being issued and then vacated. Finally, so what happens to these sentences once, what happens to these summonses once they're disposed as guilty, and what are the sentences? So a summons can result in multiple sentences, and they can be categorized into monetary sentences, imprisonment, imprisonment alternatives, and other. So what you essentially see here, that red line is a fine. And what you essentially see is that in, in, nine, in 2003, about 80% of all summonses resulted in a fine. This went up to almost 100% by 2013. The most frequent fine amount is $25. Surcharge, which is the purple line, and, and criminal victim assistance fee, which is following the same trend as the surcharge, both declined, as did fine with imprisonment alternative, which is the blue line. Other charges include unconditional discharge, conditional discharge, community service, and educational groups. These were relatively low in terms of a percent um, as a charge. We're gonna do more analyses with these sentences and fines, so we don't really get in depth with this. We wanna do follow-up analyses um, in the next coming months. So to sort of summarize, uh, as you saw, there are fewer summonses being issued over the course of the decade. And few summonses are resulting in convictions or guilty dispositions, although this is increasing over time. Many warrants are issued, but most are cleared. The top five charges, as you saw, was uh, public consumption of alcohol, disorderly conduct, public urination, uh, riding your bicycle on the sidewalk, and park offenses. And there's a lot of variability in terms of what the outcomes are for these various charges. And um, as you'll see in the report, although I didn't show you this in the presentation, no two boroughs are really alike. There's a lot of borough level variability in how these summonses are being processed. And that's it, thank you so much. You are still the most remarkable presenter I've ever seen. It's just really astonishing to take this kind of topic with this kind of complexity and this density of data and put it forward so clearly and so succinctly is a real skill. Thank, thank you so much. Jeremy, you did good.
You did good. Um, so as you see, this, what probably to most people is a seemingly innocent, probably innocuous, um, easy topic is a very complex topic because understanding the balance between preserving that which we have accomplished and how we have gotten here, but also making the necessary changes to keep the system going forward and being responsive to what we now see in the city, I think is very important. And just before I invite questions, let me just remind everybody that as we have this dialogue, there's nothing axiomatic about staying within the strict confines of the system that it exists and simply moving offenses from one category to another. There are lots of creative ways to think about these things. There's some terrific creative thinking going on around the country around this. And in fact, in other, in other countries um, that have similar criminal justice systems to ours and face similar problems. So with that, may I invite all three speakers, is that all right, to come up and take any questions? I just think it'll be easier if we do it that way. Now you see where the real bosses are. Oh, it's an audience mic, okay. If anyone uh, is leaving before uh, questions, or copies of the report, you know, 90 some pages if you want, you really want to know everything about some of this. Okay, who's on first? Gary. I'm just surprised to see most of the, most of the uh, warrants or the summonses dismissed for riding a bicycle Sidewalk, why would that result in such a high level of dismissals? Yeah. <laughs> no, the judge is not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not really sure. I think part of it is that it may be that it could be uh, issued as a moving violation potentially. Uh, some of the people that I've talked to said maybe riding bicycles should be a moving violation rather than a C summons, or that it should be a part of a tribunal. But I think the man sitting next to you can answer that better than anyone else. Justin. There are, can, there can you introduce two, yourself? I'm uh, Justin Barry, I'm the Chief Clerk of Criminal Court. Uh, there are two subsections of writing yeah, right on the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, one is a civil penalty, one is a criminal. The civil does not require. The civil uh, subsection does not require endangerment. The criminal section does require that the police officer witness or with factual allegations that the rider of the bicycle endangered somebody on the sidewalk. It's very easy for the police to miss that. You know, there's always a logical answer, Rory. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Rory Lance, my chair of the Courts and Legal Services Committee and the City Council. One of the things that the, the Reforms to summons court were really comprehensive and um, touched all the things that we were interested in, except one, which was um, what kind of guidance and training are given to the police department and then filtering out to the officers about um, some of the most common errors in writing these summonses. And so in the course of preparing this report, did you see anything that the police department um, is doing to uh, let its officers know what are some of these, these most common errors and, and how they can uh, correct them because otherwise we're just going to see the same percentage of summons as being defective, either technically defective or legally insufficient um, without any improvement. Do you know so? I can answer. So we, as I mentioned in my remarks, we presented our findings to Commissioner Bratton and his team and that issue came up. It's not for us to say what, what they're thinking about doing or have done in terms of training. Uh, but there are folks from the police department here who could who could answer your question, Councilmember. We, we, we didn't do we didn't dig we didn't dig deeper than the data we had from OCA in terms of uh, some of the the background uh, some dynamics here. So, um, but it's an obvious question, which is what, what what which of these to what extent could some of these issues be addressed through training? But that's you know, for the police department to answer. I saw a hand up in the back. Yeah, I saw a hand. I didn't see that. Yes, please. Uh, Frida, just wait for. How much of the money for the fines is collected? How much ends in civil judgment? And what happens if there's a civil judgment? You want a report that I thought answered all questions? Yeah, right. There's always no. one. That's not <laughs> great. 
So um, our data only speaks to the amount that was imposed, imposed uh, rather than gathered. So I can't really speak to how much revenue was gathered. What I can say is, and I did not mention this, but it's in the report, in 2013, about $5 million um, of sentences and fines were imposed, uh, but I can't speak to how much of it was gathered. We just simply don't have that data. Yeah, I, we, we don't have the data in the room unless somebody has it and, and is not volunteering. Who else? Vinny? So from the data that I've looked at, and I haven't looked at it very systematically, that's the next set of analyses is actually going to be really complicated to, to tease out that timeline. But from the few that I've looked at, it seems like people are coming in a couple of days later and the um, We do need to look at that more systematically, but that seems to be mainly what's happening is that they're coming later and then the case is getting disposed. They're coming voluntarily. Voluntarily. They're, they're coming voluntarily. It's an important distinction. And actually, I didn't know that. That's great. Gary? I am comfortable. I think that process has worked well. Uh, the administrative tribunals are efficient, and I think uh, uh, gumming up the criminal justice system, uh, as can be argued with some of these charges, is certainly the consequences are far greater than putting into uh, the administrative uh, framework and making whatever adjustments need to be made. But I, I'm quite confident that could be done. Anyone else? Press? David? Uh, so you mentioned that um, you, know, you weren't able to do demographic data by race because that wasn't available in the data. Now, it was available in a portion of the data, I believe, from an earlier part of the time frame that you looked at it. Were you able to make any findings from, from that time uh, when there was racial data available? And can you say why it was that that demographic data by race fell off of the sums? Why was that taken off? And what year did that fall off? So, I did not, excuse me, um, I did not examine it systematically because frankly I just didn't know at whether the missing data was systematic or not, so I just didn't even want to look at the trends. Um, I'm assuming at some point it just came off of the form and that's why it's not in there anymore. But if our, our goal was to look at longitudinal trends and that wouldn't have really allowed for that, so I did not look at the race data. Did the chief judge know why that fell off the form and when that happened? I really don't. I, know, I don't know that any of uh, our people do. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Well trained, Justice. It was taken off of the form, uh, I, I think, around uh, the last revision, which is about five or six years ago. Uh, it was not being used, it was not being filled out accurately, uh, and it was just skewing the data to the point where there was a lot of errors in it. Uh, I think there's been a renewed interest in it, uh, a renewed uh, interest in making sure that that data is reported correctly. Uh, and we've been working with NYPD uh, not only to put that box back on the form, but to make sure that it's filled out accurately so we can now study this data. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Before you go, I want to do the thing I love doing most about this is thanking Mutual. You know, every time I do this, it's such a pleasure. Mutual has been so supportive to us over the years and so many not-for-profits, and they are the most gracious people in the world to work with. So, Ed, Colin, Taryn, where are you? Thank you all very, very much, and please say thank you to Tom. Thank you. And of course, thank you all for attending this morning. We will be back to you soon with our next event. Good to see you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Get a copy of the report. And get a copy of the report. <laughs>